to the second episode of Thrill of It All. I want to thank everyone for their encouragement as we work out the kinks of the show. In this episode, Keith Huffnagel is my guest, and we talk about his move to California, turning pro for fun, riding for real, the DC Super Tour, and starting Huff. This episode is short, but I hope you enjoy it. Probably later in the year, 92, that I actually moved there. Right. Because I was going to college there. Oh, I never knew that. You yeah, I was going college? to SF State. Oh, wow. What were you studying in college? I was just trying to go to college. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's very admirable of you, though. There's well, not that many skateboarders that... Yeah, in my family, it was... So my family, how you know, I was raised is that you go to school, you know, you go to high school, and then you go to college, and then you get your master's, and, and then you get a good job. So that was just like expected of you, and you grew up just thinking that was the way you had to do it? Well, I didn't know that was the way, but that was like, you had to go the school route. And I was very anti the school route. It's definitely not for everyone, but yeah. um, you know, I think we're all different. We all have different learning disabilities, or we have to learn in different ways. Yeah. And uh, it was hard for me. Yeah. You know, but um, so, you know, that's where I went. I went to college there. I actually only lasted six months. I turned pro, and then um, I quit to travel the world. And you turned pro for fun, right? Yep. What was your first board graphic? It was like a knockoff Keith Haring kind of thing. It was um, like three of his things that we just knocked off. I was a I was a Keith Haring fan, and you right. know, it was it was cool to knock off other people's things. So yeah, I think Pecky around that same time had a dolphin board or something. Pecky like. had a dolphin, so there was, you know, at that point it was I had a Wonder Bread one. Keenan had the um, what did Keenan have? He had like no Orangina, and then Pecky yes. had the dolphin one. I remember those graphics were really clean and cool, yeah. like that time period. I mean, and I was, you know, in San Francisco and watching you guys come up, and I kind of felt like I had a little bit of an inside track watching, you know, you and Popecki, because before I got to San Francisco, I didn't know who either of you guys were, you know, and that was pretty quick. Like, you guys turned pro pretty quickly after yeah. you got the, gotten there. Yeah. It was kind of the way it was back then. There wasn't a formula to go pro. It was kind of like, if the right people are vouching for you, then it's just yeah, on. They just need to put out more boards, so yeah. they chose us. <laughs> <laughs> did Ron Allen ask you to write for fun, or was it, like, how, how did you get linked up with fun? So basically, um, Keenan Milton and I used to make sponsor me tapes together and send them out when we were in New York. Where'd you, where'd you grow up in New York? I grew up in Manhattan on uh, 23rd Street and 1st Avenue. Oh, okay. So kind of, it's not Lower East Side, but it's like Midtown Lower East Side. Yeah. And what about Keenan? Keenan grew up in more in Harlem on like 125th and 1st. And how did you guys meet? Being that's kind of far apart, um, right? Yeah, I mean, New York's like we all skate the same spot. So oh, okay. um, where I actually met Keenan, I have no idea. But yeah. it's kind of like you skate the banks or you'll be skating Union Square. You'll be skating somewhere. And then all of a sudden, you're just kind of like hanging out with this kid. And then they're sleeping over your house. And you become, you know, best buddies. And yeah. That was it, and we just connected, and um, we made our uh, we made videos together. I mean, this yeah. is like 90, 91? This is probably or yeah. These are late eighties into the nineties. Yeah. You know, we were fan. You know, we were just send the tapes to places we were fans of. So we, yeah. You know, we liked Eighth Street. We liked Life Skateboards, and at that point, we sent it to Life Skateboards, and um, Dave Andrix started sending us boards. Yeah, Andrix, great dude. So he was sending us boards. And then one day we called H Street Life and Ron Allen picked up the phone and he was like, you know, we were kind of already talking to him and he was mm -hmm. like, hey, I'm leaving, I'm going to San Francisco to start this brand fun. Do you guys want to come along? And, you know, we're like, yeah, why not? Like, what is, what are we doing over here? <laughs> wow. I mean, we would have just been left in the dust if like. Yeah, because yeah. that time period, things are kind of splitting yeah. apart. Yeah. And you guys knew that? We didn't, we didn't know the back end of it. We just, um. But you would have you would have given up, I mean, the chance to ride for you know H Street or you know. yeah totally. Which who knows what was happening? Yeah. You know, we're we're just innocent young skaters. That's kind of a leap of faith, though, right? Yeah, there. totally. Just jump, <laughs> jump. In. I mean, Ron Allen's cool. I get it. But. Yeah, and it was you know it was Ron Allen, Jesse Newhouse, and John Reeves. Yeah. So, and then we started going out to San Francisco, and then we started like actually driving cross country with Ron Allen. Which wow. was insane too. Why was it insane? <laughs> it was fun, but it's, you know, I remember it was me, John Reeves, J. 
Jesse Newhouse, Keenan, and Ron just hopped in like a, a Civic hatchback and just drove from San Francisco to New York. Wow. No tour, just like driving. No, no, we stopped in every little city and did demos. Oh, really? Yeah. In a, in a Civic, or yeah. in a Honda Civic? Yep. Wow. I mean, for us, it's heaven. That's 91? Before you did that, right? <sighs> it was probably mid-92 or late, or 93. I remembered like seeing you and you know you being like, a little bit nicer than everyone else to me at that time. <laughs> and it was kind of, it kind of seemed like, you know, the, the dudes at Embarcadero had a little more of a chip, like they were protecting their zone, you know? Yeah. They weren't as open to be like, what's up? Like, who are you? Where are you from? Whereas people that were from elsewhere were pretty open to communicate with other outsiders because they were outsiders themselves. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Embarcadero was tough. I yeah. remember rolling up being like, you know, these kids are kind of assholes. Like, you know, they're always asking for money and they just, they just want stuff off of you. Yeah. And I get it. Cause it's kind of like you're paying your dues. Or and New York was like that. You yeah. know, it's like I was in the culture of kids that were doing that to other people coming into our yeah. terrain. So I was, I was used to it. I was fine with it. But it was also like, you know, eventually they, they, they just give up and then they become your friends. Um, was this around the time, like I know you remember you had the helmet hair, the blonde yep. helmet hair. Is that in 92-ish too? Yep. I think I moved to uh, San Francisco with that hair. I was full, full bleaching my hair like every week. Yeah, and it was an interesting haircut too. It was like super cool. I remember being stoked on it. But I it, just let it grow and I just cut my bangs because I needed to see. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. I, I really liked that era though. That was kind of like watching you first start to hop from block to block at like brown marble and like some of that stuff was around that time period of the helmet hair. And I just remembered, like even though I was you know somewhat of a peer. I just remember being a fan as well and the fun graphics and the boards were always really cool and I thought that it was kind of like the underground reel like you know you didn't really know who all the guys were it was kind of like the next generation you know we were trying to put Liver's Edge on and then we were trying to put like Gino on you know those kind of people but it was such a small company yeah you know it was run out of deluxe yeah and it was Ron Allen's baby so it was just you know it had growing problems as a, yeah. as a company. It was and kind of like a side project. And it's, and it's, yeah, and it's yeah. inside of another bigger company. Yeah. So um, it's not that easy. Yeah, so what was the demise? Like, what, what was the, did you get a call? Like, it's over? Or did you? What happened was we were we were all on tour. It was me, Ron, Keenan, and Pupeki. And I remember Keenan and Pupeki just not being happy at all. There was something that happened that they were super upset about. And we were, I don't even know, we were somewhere like Chicago-ish, somewhere in the Midwest. And um, <clears throat> they just basically were like, yo, we're done. We're gonna, we're just, we're done. We're leaving the tour and we quit. And they just took off. You were on the trip too? I was on the trip too. Well, and you were gonna be like, well, I'm still here on the trip. I got kind of left and I remember I went to Chicago with Ron and I started hanging out in Chicago. Just like, you know, it's more of like, you know, a lot of people there, we could hang out. And then I just realized that I should just go back to San Francisco and, and not be on this anymore because my buddies left and I'm, I'm like, you know, one man standing, which just isn't going to work for me. Yeah. And um, so I told Ron that I, I quit and I'm going to go back to San Francisco. So I basically flew back to San Francisco. So the tour just ended there. Ron, tour ended, the shops. Yeah, Ron ended up driving back by himself and um, it just ended. Like that was it for that crew. It did continue to go on. There was, you know, a new team, and they kept on doing it. So when you went back to San Francisco, is that did you like get on reel from there, or was there something I else? I did, but I kind of just stayed being like a free agent for a while, while because I just kind of wanted to figure it out. Yeah. Um, Keenan and Gino were like, because they started writing for kind of the Rocco camp. Like yeah. I think Keenan was on Plan B, I think, for a minute, and Gino was on One Hundred One. Yeah. And they kept on, you know, I went down there and kind of hung out for a minute and I started writing those boards. And then I went back to San Francisco and I just remember I was, I was just skating around San Francisco and Thibaut pulled up in a car and he was like, you know, you need to write for, you know, come write for real and all this. And I was like, let me think about it. I'll come in. And then, um, I just, I think I hung out for a couple of days and then I went in and talked to them and, you know, it was a, it was for me a better move because. I was hanging out with like Kelly Bird and Kelch and all those dudes that were kind of the SF crew at that time. Yeah, I lived in the city. And yeah. yeah. So for me, I wanted to be in San Francisco because yeah. it was more of a New York feeling to me. Yeah. 
and that was a better move to be with a company that was there. So yeah. I, I chose Real, and I'm still on it today. I'm not, you know, I'm not a big pro skateboarder anymore, but they still, you know, support wow. me. How long has that been? 25 years. Wow. That is amazing, man. Yeah. That's a testament to awesomeness on both your parts. Yeah. And loyalty and just supporting each other. And at this time, though, when you went to Real, like, school was done, right? Yeah. How did you, how did you break that to your parents, and how did they react? <laughs> Uh, I mean, for me, I just basically, I think I called my mom or my dad and I just told them that I wasn't going to do school anymore and I was going to pursue skateboarding and they were extremely upset because of how they saw, you know, basically they don't see the path. I mean, they were upset about it, but then once Yeah, they, they couldn't see where it was going to be. Yeah, I told them I didn't need any, I didn't need any help from them. I'm making some money, which was barely anything. And, you know, from that point forward, they did help me out a little bit, but I was on my own. Like I never, I never turned around and ask them for anything or and they were happy about that they they were really happy when they like saw the success of it yeah they started seeing it in magazines yeah. and things like that when they start to see that it's kind of undeniable at that point you're you're paving your own path and even though it wasn't the path that they like had you know like envisioned for you oh, yeah. like it's cool to see an individual like oh i had nothing to do with getting you that car I, you're doing your taxes well i didn't have anything to do with that <laughs> You know, um, I think yeah. at a certain point they have to recognize that. Yeah, I mean, that helps out. And, you know, they would go to restaurants and, like, skaters would be waiting on them and they'd ask them if, you know, they yeah. were, you know, so, like, they were, like, super stoked on that stuff. Totally. When you were growing up, like, when you guys were skating in New York and stuff, like, were you dreaming about being a pro skateboarder or was it not really even on the car? Like, when you guys are making those sponsoring videos, was your vision like hopefully we'll get sponsored by one of these companies and be in these videos that we're watching and hopefully someday we'll be pro skateboarders no i don't think we even like thought that we would get there we just wanted to, we were more that we more had this addiction of skateboarding and we wanted to go out to the spots that we saw you know we saw the spots in the magazines or the videos and our dream was just to go out and skate them it was not to be like turn pro and whatever pro brings you um, I think that was I think that was different though that was a different time where I don't know do you even think you're at that level like you're just you've gotten yeah, you know you've you gotten mean. better at skateboarding and you're improving yeah. but also these people that you see in the videos in the magazines they're 10 steps ahead of you it yeah. looks like it yes yeah, yeah and the way the way it's packaged yeah you're like not even in the ballpark yeah yeah so to start getting free stuff and start getting people interested in you that was just a big acknowledgement, um, acknowledgement for us to be like, they like what we're doing. Do it again, you know, make more videos. Yeah, keep doing it. Yeah, and, then and that was come out and skate and do that stuff. Right, and that was kind of you and Keenan like skating together in that period, pushing each other. Was that yeah? Like, I mean, there was a crew of us. There was, you know, I think we had a couple of video cameras, and it was, you know, me and Keenan, Chris Keith, Mike Hernandez, Ben Larry's Edge, Gina, Gina Inucci. We would all kind of just go out and skate. And it was like, who can film? And then, you know, whoever's going to try a trick, we're all going to help each other. Yeah. You know, and everyone ended up going out and getting sponsored or turned pro or something like that. Yeah, that's right. That's a really Not cool everyone, but Chris majority Keith, of people. Chris Keith wrote for uh, fun too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I have a Keenan story too. There was a conversation, and he was always really nice to me as well, but there was a conversation I, I overheard, and he's like, dude, I got to get to the airport. I got to get to the airport. And I was like, I have a car. I can take you to the airport. And he was like, really? You can take me to the airport? And he's like, I gotta go like right now. And I was like, yeah, no problem, jump in. Anyway, I gave him a ride to the airport and I thought to myself, like, he just needs a ride. He's always been nice to me. I know he's like part of the cool guy crew, but I just felt like it was a good thing to do and it was, I, I didn't have anything going on, obviously, because I was just sitting around doing nothing. <laughs> anyway, I gave him a ride to the airport. He was super appreciative, got out of the car, and he's like, thanks so much, man. And he went to hand me some money and I was like, no, it's cool, man, it's cool. And I didn't even look to see how much money it was. And he goes, no, man, I really appreciate it, and I want you to take it. And I was like, all right, thanks. And then I looked in my hand, he gave me a $100 bill. Oh, shit. He gave me a $100, $100 bill to take him <laughs> to the airport. And like, <laughs> and I was like, I was seriously tripping. He shut the door, and I looked in my hand, and I was holding a $100 bill for taking him to the airport. And I just remember being like, dude, that guy's the best. <laughs> that's, that's classic Keenan move, just to, you know, I don't know. He, he probably didn't even have that much money, which was, you know, he's super generous. Yeah. I, I didn't know. I was like, this guy must be rich. And that was, I don't know, I, I think he, he would have been on fun or it, it might even have been like, I don't know. But I just remembered at the time it being a really big deal. I didn't, I wasn't making much money and 
him to hand me a hundred dollar bill. And you know, it's a 20 minute drive, but yeah. I had a little Suzy I mark and back then gas would have cost me $7 probably, yeah. you know, and it would have taken me 40 minutes to take him to and from. And anyway, from that moment on, like every time I saw Keenan, I was like, dude, there's the most generous dude on the planet <laughs> when I'd see him. Um, but that's my Keenan story. Um, so at that time you started filming for real videos. Yeah, I mean, right away, it's like once you're on, they, I think they just start sending me places. I remember just traveling a lot. You know, times were different then. When, when you went on a trip, you didn't always have a filmer or a photographer. Like, sometimes you had a photographer, you know, Morford, yeah. Morford was kind of the main person. Yeah. Um, so he was always taking photos, but not always, you know, people just weren't filming all the time. So yeah. it was like Dave Meddy was filming for a while. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. It was like later, later that like Wolf and them came back in the picture. Yeah, that would have been like 95, 6 or whatever, yeah. 6 probably. And then I would always just go out to New York and, you know, film with like RB or whoever it was. Yeah. You know, kind of like, what well, I don't even know, that's probably later. Anyway. That sounds about right. Like, yeah, I guess 97-ish. Yeah. Maybe RB was. Yeah. In that time period, was it a big, I remember like your career, you know, as a peer, you know, with real like it made sense but then I remember it seemed like you got put on like a world stage when like DC put the like the like super team together was would you say that that's kind of like a point where your career got like elevated to like a whole other level yeah I think so I mean um, whenever DC started they kind of came out with their boom of you know you know it was Danny and Colin and Deerdick and uh, Rudy and kind of like they pushed that whole thing and then they wanted to build up like a, a you know, there are lower lower pro dudes or and dudes or whatever, and um, you know it was like me and Scott and Kane Gale and Carl Shipman, Moses Conan. There was like a whole crew of dudes. Rick like, Howard was probably right between those two crews. Right? They came a little after, so oh, okay. Rick and Mike came a little after. Oh right. So it was basically that was like the first crew, and then we went out and. I'm not sure if Rick and Mike were on the first. I think they were on the first, actually, DC Super Tour. Yeah, I think they were. I remember it being, like, a real big deal. But I remember, I think Mike was on Vans for a while, and then he left Vans, and then Rick and Mike kind of came in as a package deal into DC, and then, you know, they got footwear. Because I remember riding their models a lot. Yeah, yeah, I remember those shoes. And then, good. And then That's, like, 98, probably. Probably, right? yeah. yeah. Or a little earlier, maybe. Yeah, 97, Because I think... Um, because I think I had, on audio, I think I had a shoe that was kind of similar. It was like a Rick, Rick Howard ripoff. Yeah. And I think that that shoe dropped in 98. And so his shoe would have dropped in 97. Yeah, it sounds right. Yeah. Um, so then those dudes were kind of like, you know, the newer wave. And then we started doing those super tours. And then they brought in like, you know, like Josh Kellis and Stevie Williams. Yeah, like the, 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 the bigger youth, yeah. the younger youth at that yeah. point. Yeah, that seemed like it was it was a powerhouse from those like three four years. That like, shit was super fun. Like yeah. those demos, like when you go to a demo and you ollie over a pyramid and the whole the whole stadium's cheering because yeah, you of that, world. you're like, oh shit, let me do a kickflip, let me do a pressure <laughs> flip. You know, like <laughs> that's you know, then yeah. you're you're getting when you get energy from doing what you do, that's that's a whole different level of like you actually want to do even more. Yeah, it's very encouraging. Yeah. It's World Cup cheers for yeah. the things that you love to do. Yeah. yeah. So I remember doing those demos and being super nervous, but then as it went on, it was it was really enjoyable. I mean, they had it down. We would basically show up in the city, get to like hang out, relax. Then the day before the demo, we could actually go skate this park and kind of get used to it, and then go back the next day and actually do wow, it. Wow, that is demo. really cool. I've never. So you actually are a little bit used to what you're skating. So Instead you're killing of, it, yeah. To some degree, you're actually like, you know what works and doesn't work, and then you can go in and actually do a real show, Yeah. to that, some degree. That makes sense. Uh, for your personal skate career, do you think that that kind of was like the time when you felt like the most like on, on your game? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely more of my prime. I mean, I feel like I had little waves of, yeah. of like when yeah. I felt really good. You can always kind of like see in a video part like oh I felt good there I was actually really powerful I was you know on my shit yeah. there then like sometimes you're like yeah that kind of looks a little weak and a little rusty or whatever it is you know yeah. seriously yeah. you can I can tell when I'm rusty or not like you can tell yeah you know the the, the pop tells or the power of whatever you're doing yeah what was what would you think would be your favorite video part that you've had um skate more is one of my like one of the more that I'm proud of like that I worked hard at um, I mean, 
you think it was just because it was more focused put on that than say the real videos? Well, it was more that I went harder for it and I actually like spent more time on it, I think. I mean, all the real videos I was stoked on. Yeah. Um, and some were just kind of like, hey, we're doing a video, give us all your footage. Yeah, that's kind of what I meant. I mean, I meant that like, it seemed like Skate More, like it was like a concentrated effort. Hey, everybody, we're all gonna film for this video collectively. Yeah. It's gonna come out here and we're all gonna do our best over the next like two years. Yeah. It seemed like that was the deal yeah. with that video. Yeah, so it was, you know, that's kind of like make it or break it. Like, you know, it's been two years and, you know, give 30 seconds of footage. Yeah, yeah. You look like you suck at yeah. that. And then also, if you have like a shoe, you feel like that could be the end of it. Yeah. And there's a lot at stake, you yeah. know, at that, you know, for a footwear video. Yeah. You know? And you don't want to get hurt. I mean, you know, one, one injury can take you out for a whole year if you're... Uh, totally. And then that really cuts you down to the 30 second you yeah. know, point where you're like, oh, this is the reality of it. Yeah. So from there, when, you know, when, when did you make the jump to open the first Huff retail store? And what was the, like, what was the catalyst for you wanting to do that? <laughs> um, I think a lot of things. So basically, I always traveled to major cities around the world. I was always, you know, from the U.S. being in New York and L.A. all the time, San Francisco. And then going out to, I, w I was going out to Japan, you know, two to four times a year. Wow. And I saw this culture of just, it was streetwear, it was skateboarding, but it was different. It, was, it wasn't what skateboarding was. It was high-end brands, small, small brands that just were in these like um, little boutiques. And I was always like a fan of it. And it was like, I'd go to Japan and buy stuff. Or, you know, it was like Bathing Ape was happening. And yeah. like all these things were happening. And you're like, what is that? You know, I don't know about this. It's not in the US. And I kind of became this like underground fan and it was, so after Keenan died, Keenan died in 2001, and um, Anne and I were like, let's get out of LA, let's move back to San Francisco. And she wanted to open a, uh, a women's boutique, and she was working at a women's boutique here in um, Pacific Palisades that was just like crushing it, like just. And she just saw the insides of the business. She saw the insides of the business, and she was like, let's do this in San Francisco. So we went to San Francisco, we did our research, and we found out that there was way too many like women's like contemporary stores. Too much competition. To too do. much competition. I was like, no. So I was like, I was like, let's do this like kind of like street wary like skate thing. I'm, I have all these people that are connected in it. I'm like, let's do it in San Francisco because San Francisco had culture and had these rad stores like FTC and True and Deluxe, but it didn't have what I kind of saw around the world. Yeah, the vision that you saw. And. Um, we're like, yeah, let's try it. And we, you know, we called up all the all the major like shoe companies and started carrying like Stussy and Supreme and some other brands from overseas. And you know, it just it just basically we had enough of at that time the sneaker world was kind of going insane. Yeah. And we had enough of the like super exclusive things that we just kept on buying and piling up. And somehow the kids on chat chat rooms figured out we had all this shit. And we opened up, and the first day we had a line of, I don't even know how many kids, 50 to 100 kids. Wow. And they bought all the product. Holy shit. And we're just like, you know, me and Anna are just sitting there like, we don't know what the fuck just happened. And how, how do we get more of that inventory in to keep, kind of keep the momentum going? So you basically got your first month's rent on day one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we basically, we did so well on the first day that we were just like, I was so nervous, I was like, you know, what are we doing? My name's on the fucking store. Yeah, what was, that? what was the idea behind that? It was a battle to put up. I, I came up with a thousand shitty names that just all sucked. And then um, Anne had this friend who did a bad company and she called it Woo. Her name is like Stacy Wu. And um, she was like, you have to just call it your name. And I was like, I'm not that person. Yeah. And um, so in the end, I kind of gave up. I just was like, yeah, it's fine. Like, whatever, it'll just become something and I'll forget about it. And um, that's how we named it. It seemed like it so wasn't your personality to call it that, that that made it cool. You know what yeah, I mean? That's not, I would never like, I can't even wear the word huff big on a shirt because it's like, I'll wear it on like the back or something, but yeah. I can't wear it like bold. Yeah, because yeah. I'm like, you feel like Miguel and <laughs> Animal Chin. Yeah, <laughs> no, I get it. I mean, I'm just saying like from the outside, I was like, well, that's interesting. Like, no one's kind of, well, I guess Hasoy's done it in skating, but like, yours, yours, you know, Hasoy is Hasoy, and he can, he owns who he is. Yeah. You know, but your personalities couldn't be, you know, more different. 
So like when I first heard about it, I it was kind of weird, but at the same time I was like stoked on it because it was you. It didn't, you know what I I'm think, saying? I think I had a lot of mental issues with it for a while. Yeah, I can imagine. And I've, I've gotten, you know, way past that. And it just, it's just a name now. It's just like, you know, there's tons of brands that have people's names to it. But I also think that it almost seemed like it helped. I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong. It almost seemed like it helped your personal relevancy in skateboarding or your legacy kind of continue on past when you were in your, in your prime of skateboarding. Yeah, you totally. think that? yeah it, it, it makes a name go longer for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it ties you to that and it seems to really tie your career and all that you did in skating like and in, in give and gave Huff legitimacy as Huff took these plunges into, into fashion and these different areas. It was like, but you can never forget that what it came from yeah. because of the name that's associated with it. It's a way bigger beast now, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> let's fast forward to that. You have you basically went from a retail store and then how did it get so, go from a retail store to, to then creating a... So we opened the one door and the door was kind of like a, um, it was a multi-brand store. We, we carried multi-brands, we carried sneakers, we carried... Kind of skate related stuff but mm. we didn't really it wasn't like a hard goods store yeah and we carried a lot of streetwear things so it was probably a year later we were like let's separate let's separate the streetwear element of it into its own door and we'll turn this door into a full sneaker door mm -hmm. so we did that and it kind of worked what was the sneaker uh, i mean the streetwear door called it was just huff it was just so basically on the block of it was sutter and jones in san francisco and there was a cafe, there was an art gallery, and then there was these three doors. Mm -hmm. So we, the middle one was not um, ours, so we took, we took the one, the original, and we turned that from the multi-brand store to like an all sneaker door. And then we took the one that was two doors down and turned it into a full streetwear door. They're both called Huff. Yeah, same thing. And then I think a year later, you know, we really wanted to kind of embrace skateboarding more. So we got the middle door and we turned that into like a full skateboard wow it was like just like a skate it was like you know floor to ceiling decks and trucks and wheels and right. then it was huff apparel and then a couple other brands that we supported that so that's kind of where it started huff apparel like basically going from having a shop apparel program. yeah i mean we we from the start we started once we opened the door we started printing the logo on t-shirts printing the logo that was on the hats. h with the circle or it was a we called it like an etch-a-sketch logo so it was like lines it was like very like um it, it looked like a blocky geometric yeah yeah um, so that was our logo to start uh, and then I think we redesigned it like two or three years later and then we turned it into what it is now more of a box with, yeah. the, with just the letters in there mm -hmm. um, and then the H and stuff like that um, and so the apparel started and then you wanted to start making shoes uh, or then you moved to the LA store so after that it was 2008 and Anne was in LA and she she really wanted to help with our distribution and um, opening an LA store so we found a spot on Fairfax and we actually opened an LA store and then we um, and then we kind of used the back area to do our distribution there and then that kind of grew too big so we ended up getting like a, a small little warehouse in downtown LA mm -hmm. but then this is also 2008 when the recession hit yeah so we were, we were, it was all kind of new to us and um, we had the same patterns that we weren't changing. We were buying the same or more, you know, we weren't managing well and um, we just kind of put a halt to everything. And at the same time, we're, you know, we're getting in debt with every single vendor we have from our own production to, you know, every big person we're out there and they're just, you know, they're knocking on your door, they're, where's my money and take this product and, you know, it's like, it starts to spin and um, you know we hired some lawyers and we started figuring out what we could do we went for some loans and pretty much got denied on every single loan we you know we did all this work to be like you know whatever loan we wanted they were just like yeah at that time you know, the loans became really different. yeah they were like you got it you're golden and then when it came to the day they were like you're denied because you're too risky you're an apparel company yeah we, we experienced the same thing yeah and um, so then I you know, I, I was talking to this guy for a long time about um, Jay. I was talking to Jay about um, doing footwear, and you know, he he was part of DC in the in the early stages. Yeah, Jay Beck. I know. Yeah, and um, 
So he kind of came in and helped us out, helped us get money and helped us kind of restructure. He did creative recreation, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, so that was like kind of our saving grace at the time because we were looking at, um, we were looking at bankruptcy mm -hmm. or just trying to figure it out, you know, yeah. going, going out and, you know, asking other people for money or whatever it was. And, yeah. you know, it was a golden opportunity and Jay came in and helped us out and it wasn't easy because now we're putting more, um, more people into the kitchen. Yeah. And, um, you know, we figured it out and we all, um, we got through, he came in, I think it was 2009 when he came in. Yeah. He had a lot of connections with factories that helped us, you know, just get the process going without, you know, making heavy payments or anything like that. And he got us over the hump, or at least that helped us get over the hump. We had some hits in our product that started doing better and we were able to get more cash flow into the company. and. And as chaotic as the company was in that time, we were able to get over this big hump. Wow. I remember um, going to the uh, Agenda Emerge, you know, when they did an interview mm -hmm. with you, and it seemed like a big portion of that was focused on the cease and desist that you guys received. Yeah. Like, and I was somewhat unaware of it. I mean, I saw some of it, Stoops and, you know, the Rollerblade and some of the ones, um, but the way they were, the way they were brought up at the Agenda Emerge was amazing because your back would be turned and they'd be starting to talk to you about something and then the logo that you got the season and desist for would be on behind you and kind of turn around and give the story on the season and desist. Do you think that those season and desist really like did something for the brand as far as like how kind of rogue you guys were doing it? Like, you know, cause footwear at that time started going into this like corporate direction. Yeah. And you guys were, you know, for your slogan in terms, you're really just saying fuck it and just kind of going out there and like, doing whatever you wanted to do and it was kind of like world industries almost like back in the like you know early 90s yeah I mean for us it's like I feel like I grew up with that attitude of it's a skateboard attitude it's it is the fuck it attitude it's um you know and we were following what Rocco did and all these other people that we I thought was cool yeah um you were yeah. kind of the first person to bring that to footwear I guess is my point yeah I mean we got heavily we were we were getting cease and desist basically on almost anything we would do. And sometimes we had to pay and sometimes we didn't have to pay. Yeah. And, um, you know, for me it was, it was fun. It was like, but now, nowadays you have to be so smart about it. Like, yeah. it's basically. You're only able to do that when you don't have the experience to know what it could cost you. Yeah. The naivety um, and ignorance is bliss. We still do it, um, <laughs> but we do it on a very low radar. Yeah. Um, like limited edition products. Or, or it's just, we just don't blast it on a, um, email campaign or something yeah <laughs> or call it the same name that it is yeah you did that one quite a few times that. yeah <laughs> what do you think is the biggest biggest motivational factor for you like in business and life I mean for business it's more of you know how do you keep these businesses going and staying true to um, what they are yeah like so I have a lot of motivation to keep this place um, on track because there's a lot of people out there that are happy about it and a lot of people that probably want it to fail. And for me, it just, you know, when I look back in 10, 20 years, whatever it is, if the, if the brand's still alive, I want it to be in the right place. You know, I want it to be like, it went down the right path, it created, you know, these places and it's still keeping the, um, the DNA of the brand. Yeah. Um, and that's a very hard thing to do. It is. Um, for it to stay popular, for it to grow, you know, all the things that a business needs to do. Yeah, because the times change, the culture changes, yeah. everything changes. Yeah. You know, in life for me, it's just, for me, it's just being positive and um, being healthy yeah. and really being, really enjoying it because a lot of people don't enjoy life. Yeah. I think I'd agree with that. <laughs> so so I, I, I enjoy it. You know, I have, life has a lot of stress and ups and downs and um, I basically push, push all the stress on the side and kind of just focus on enjoying it. That's awesome. Well, yeah. that's a great closure. <laughs> Thanks for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, that's a wrap.